Appreciate everybody's participation in day one and day two. Uh, extremely positive feedback from the uh, on our panels, as evidenced by full houses, if you will, and extremely good questions and answer period by everybody from our junior officer uh, panels to the most senior folks. Along those lines, the plenary sessions to include the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Dempsey, here with us, and General John Allen, Commander of ISAF, here by VTC. A very, very uh, good interchange. And as we continue to look at uh, Joint Warfighting Conference, uh, please continue to provide us feedback on how we can uh, tweak it, in my mind, and uh, Admiral Daly's mind, to make it even better. So we, as we take a look at this morning's keynote speaker, uh, I, we welcome Mr. Michael Jones on behalf of Admiral Pete Daly, uh, CEO of the United States Naval Institute, and on behalf of AFSEA International, the great partnering team uh, here. Uh, Mr. Jones is, in fact, the chief technology advocate for Google Ventures, and a tremendous background, tremendous background. He is indeed an anthropological technologist. And for those of you who have a piece of paper, you sit down and write your definition, and you'll hear Mr. Jones speak, and then you'll understand exactly what we're talking about here. But he is charged with advancing the, the world's information around the world. He and I had discussions about him talking to presidents of countries, really in an education mode, getting them to understand better what Google is all about. The term I use is how can Google be a tool in the kit bag of whatever nation it happens to be, whatever organization it happens to be, military, civilian, or other. You take a look at that, and uh, you look at his background, and it does not just start a few years ago. He's been an inventor and computer programmer since the fourth grade. That's been a couple of years. And definitely a developer of scientific and interactive computer uh, graphics. He, in fact, was the, uh, <clears throat> the engineer who designed uh, Google Maps, Earth, and the, uh, and the local search. You take a look at that, and you have, in fact, a, a national treasure, a national treasure from the standpoint of he is an ambassador, yes, for Google, but he's an ambassador for the United States as he interfaces around the world with a product to help nations and to help the free world. So I would ask you at this time to please join me in giving a, a warm United States Naval Institute and AFC International welcome to Mr. Michael Jones. Well, that's a, that's a very uh, intimidating introduction. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, you are the reason I am here. I'm, I'm not on some other reason. I'm here to see you. Uh, what I want to talk about today is, is, is this idea <clears throat> And it's a sort of a meta topic, so you have to step back a little bit, think a little bit broadly. I don't want to talk to you just about the Google that you know or the technologies that you know. We have the privilege at Google to be involved in a number of very aggressive, very forward-thinking things, maybe, maybe too forward-thinking, you know, dangerous things. We just got our first driver's license uh, and license plate for the first robot-driven car. We got it in Nevada. It's a state that's more flexible than the other 49 states. Uh, and they gave us a license for our car to drive all by itself all around Nevada. You know, so, so things like that, that, that kind of thing. I want to talk to you about that. So what I found uh, in my work, and just to be clear, uh, my you know, work with Google uh, Maps and Google Earth, I've, when, when we created Google Earth in my dining room, it was a company called Keyhole that we named for a reason that some of you may appreciate. Uh, there were four of us. And in 10 years now, there's a billion users of that technology. So you can go from you know, four, four, four guys with an idea to a billion people using it, some of them uh, all throughout NGA, some through, all throughout the DOD, no doubt at least one or two of them in Al-Qaeda. You know, so it's a double-edged sword, you know, public technology. But it's an interesting uh, path where good ideas can make it to every person in the world. That's just very interesting. And so I'm going to talk to you about that. And the, the, the interesting and scary part what if the kinds of technologies that I know about, or the companies like Google, Microsoft, or whoever, develop, were actually to become national technical means, in the sense of they were the best available technology, and they were the exquisite technology that gives us an advantage. How, how would that advantage be maintained? Because it would be an open public technology. And so I'm, there's a, 
it's not a hypothetical question. This is actually happening. And I want to talk to you about that because I want people like you to think about that and guide what happens next. It's not just hypothetical, though, so I need your help. Okay, here we go. So <clears throat> the first thing I'm going to talk about is, is going to work, I'm sure. I have great confidence. I'm going to hit a button, and everything's going to be great. There we go. Oh, we have a little bit too much good stuff. Okay, <clears throat> there are, as of March, 7 billion people on the Earth. And so here's, here's a, a technology man I think about. Maybe one of them knows something that you don't know. You know? That seems reasonable. I mean, at first you wouldn't think that. Like, you wouldn't think that they know something the chairman of the Joint Chiefs wouldn't know or the president wouldn't know. But in truth, out of 7 billion people, there's somebody that knows something fantastic that none of us know, right? There's an Einstein out there somewhere that knows something great, and there's some average guy that happens to know something just going on in his neighborhood that's interesting to know. The whole IC is built on kind of milking that cow. And it's, but it's always done in this very uh, official way. I want to talk to you about a, an interesting casual way. So the idea of what kind of data is available just from users of computers. And, and <clears throat> users of computers might include users of phones. So it, basically just everybody. So here's an example. This is a picture of uh, the Philippines. This is Manila. This is a map, it looks like a Google map, you can tell. We, we couldn't get any good data for the Philippines. For some reason, there was no company building good data for the Philippines. We didn't have the NGA to help us. And so what we did was we built a program called Google Map Maker. So it's, it's mapmaker.google.com. You go and it shows you, you type in a, a place or you drive around on it and it's a satellite picture that you'd see in Google Maps or Google Earth, and you take your, your cursor, your, your mouse, and you can draw on top of the satellite picture, draw a line, and say, that's Highway 395, or 95, and that's Pennsylvania Avenue. And you can say, that's 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, and that's the White House. And you can put a little label there. And you can label your own map. And we launched that. Everything there is drawn by local users in the Philippines. It started out without even a, a, without even a, a water boundary, Okay, so I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit closer for you. <clears throat> okay, I'm just going to one, one more step. Okay, so, so everything there, every, every line, every color, every edge, every place is done by, by people in the Philippines who don't have the highest per capita income of computers and mapping. They don't have special geography classes in high school. It, it's basically they want people to come to their party or shop at their store, so they put their place on the map. So it worked pretty well. We've done this in uh, 184 countries now. We have that kind of mapping in 184 countries. So if you think about like the G20 countries and the G other countries, okay? The G20 countries, say like the first world, has Navtech and Teleatlas. It has all these, you know, all the service people that do things you might want to do. The, the other countries don't have those. You know, if we had to do some national business in Gambia, who would you go to buy data from in Gambia? You know, like, the, there's nobody. Either the CIA, CIA had it in the World Factbook, or NGA had it from 20 years ago on some activity, or else there'd be nothing. We actually have perfect maps of places that you've never even heard of. And I'll show you an example of that. This is uh, Google Earth. Um, <clears throat> and we're going to take a little a view, a view into a uh, uh, theater of recent interest. So this is uh, the area that we all talk about all the time these days. And I'm going to show you uh, something uh, that for a while, you know, I'd never heard of, actually. And this is one of these, Pakistan is one of the countries where people use Google Map Maker to map out their country, OK? So the colored lines are disputed borders. That's not so important. But there's this uh, city here called Abbottabad. And there's a compound there illustrated in 3D. And that was done by users of Google. OK, now, now uh, two years ago, you, you could have you gotten the, you know, five Congressional Medals of Honor if you had that picture, right? And you knew what it meant, <clears throat> two things. But this was done by everyday users, and that's the interesting thing that's going on. I mean, they live there, so why, why don't they do that? Here, here's the map of Abbottabad from, from Google Map Maker. It's, it looks like a Google map of uh, Virginia Beach. It, it, it's the same level of detail. And in fact, <clears throat> and this was from before Osama bin Laden, right? So the night of uh, OBL raid, this guy posted on Twitter from an a internet cafe. He said, you know, it's like 12.15 here, and there's a helicopter outside. That's really unusual for here. Okay. So, so do you understand that? It's like, like, so there's this picture that's pretty famous now of 
the president and all these people in the, in the, in, in the White House Situation Room, they're all staring at the screen, you know, the sweat on their face. Well, the same second of that picture, this guy is saying, hey, there's a helicopter up there on Twitter. Okay, so if you, don't, if you don't understand that, you know, that, that's actually a change of how the world works. Right? I mean, it's, it's, that is, you, can be, you can have a secret, you know, your mission's a secret, your preparation's a secret. He didn't know what they were doing, but, but he knew that they were doing something. So there's a, a question of, like, like, imagine, like, low observable technology. It doesn't work when there are humans there because they're all connected. That changes things. In some cases, very unfortunately. On the other hand, it's kind of interesting. This guy, you can send him mail. He has a, a, a there, there's Osama bin Laden's house. That was, that triangle was drawn as a, a entity before the raid by local people in Abbottabad. So, you know, we had this program, 25 million if it would give us a tip. Anybody have any idea? Some guy drew in that, that lot just because it was there. I mean, obviously it wasn't bin Laden, right? I mean, obviously not. I mean, maybe not. I don't, I don't know. But the point is, it's like people are just, people are connected in a way that you might not have thought. And, for example, this guy that, this guy that, uh, <clears throat> that saw the, uh, the helicopter, you can send him, he has the Gmail account, so you can just send him mail and say, well, what do those special, uh, you know, SEAL team uh, helicopters sound like? You can just call him. You know, it's, it's so, so it's, it's, a, it's a different world. It's not a world that anybody intended, but it, it's, 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 I want you to think about that because actually it, it, it's a world we have to steer to somewhere good. Now, I'm going to show you an example. Um, those of you that have occasion to work with remotely sensed imagery know that higher resolution imagery is better than lower resolution imagery. And so there are these different levels of uh, national technical means imagery. And so I would challenge you to say, at what level would be one centimeter per pixel imagery? And you'd say, well, you know, I couldn't say, but if you could say, you'd say, at no level. I mean, let's think of it that way. So this is a, what a one centimeter per pixel image looks like from downtown New York City. And so this is in Google Earth. And so you'd say, well, how do you get one centimeter per pixel imagery? And, and so here's what you see. This is very strange. But at the very bottom there, there are some men standing. <clears throat> and if you look, they're looking up. And there's a little white line coming from that man's hand. Do you see that? Yeah? OK. There's a big balloon up there with a camera hanging on the bottom of it. OK? So we have the national laboratories, like in Los Alamos. This is the publiclaboratories.org. And if you send them $20, they'll send you a giant balloon you can inflate with a, uh, some twist ties to hold on your point-and-shoot camera that hangs off the bottom and a string, and you pull it around behind you over the park. And your camera takes pictures all the time. And you upload this picture to these people. It mosaics it together, takes the string part of it out, and uploads it to Google, and it shows up in Google Earth next month. OK? So now, obviously, you can't really ask Mata Hari to walk around Afghanistan with a big balloon, right? So that's not, that's not a, a you know, discrete surveillance technology. I mean, I understand that. But, but it's an example of, like, in, NRO can't give you centimeter pictures. So it's just something to think about. It's just it's a different situation. It's, it's, it's crazy. And, and so this has got nothing to do with us, but they have these pictures. And we say, sure, we'll take them. Sure. You know? So, so it's, it's, it's important to understand kind of what, what's really happening because it's not, I think it's really obvious sometimes what's really happening. So here's another one. People have uh, smartphones. How many of you have smartphones? Smartphones? Uh, basically everybody. Okay. Um, iPhone. Blackberry, Android, right? Those are kind of the popular most ones. So we're involved with Android. Um, and so I'm going to talk about Android, but not, not to sell you a phone, just to you understand. When, when you use your Android phone and you're driving down, down the road, it, uh, it, 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 it basically makes up a random number and says, oh, I'm agent 4003, and I'm going 20 miles an hour right now at this XY location. It does that for a couple minutes, then it picks up a new number. Oh, I'm agent 47. You know, it's, so it doesn't tell you, us who you are, but it talks about its velocity. So we get like 100 million velocity updates constantly in real time. And we integrate those, and we, we look for a locus along a road. And we have that. We color code the roads in Google Maps if you turn the driving, the driving speed on. And we show you real-time traffic. That's real-time traffic data collated from people's pockets and purses. 
with no active involvement of anybody. And if you look, like this is in LA, of course we have the highways, but we even have like little roads. That's, that's an interesting, it's an interesting direction. See, this is uh, like, you know, soldier as a, as a sensor. This is like every human as a sensor. Then how do, you, how do you extract the right data from that? And so the question isn't, is there the data, but how do you extract it? That's the new question. I'll, I'll give you quickly, tell you another one that I like a lot. This is a company that's not involved with Google. It's called Field Agent. And it's a startup, and I, I, I help them. They're, they're great. Here's what they do. It's a program you can install, and they're on uh, iPhone and Android, so you can go to the app store and install this if you want. You go to Field Agent, and you install this program <clears throat> on your phone. And you have to have a, a PayPal account, you know, PayPal, and you give them your PayPal account name and what, what they, so, so they can deposit. You know, they don't take money. They give you money. What they do is you, you do this, and then you walk around. And then someday you'll be shopping, and your phone will vibrate, and you answer it, and it's a message from field agent. Okay? It's an orange, an exc exclamation point. And it says, I'll pay you $5. Take a picture of the Pampers there in the Harris Teeter where you're standing. Okay? Because somebody like Procter & Gamble has paid them to do a survey of all the, you know, how, how good their distributors are stocking the shelves. And from your GPS and your phone, they figured out you're the closest field agent to that shelf. If you'll take a picture, you say, okay, you take a picture, and they deposit five bucks in your account. They send the picture to Pro Procter & Gamble. Okay, so people are doing these surveys, having local people, not, not, not uh, like the you know, agency director of operations. I I'm just talking about, you know, like regular people. Like say, well, I'm in the store. Sure, I'll take a picture of the Coke display, or I'll take a picture of the, the, you know, that intersection from, from, from some attorney, you know, whatever. And so you don't know who wants the picture. Or that sometimes you have questions, you know. Is the, are there more cans of Coke or Pepsi? You know, you the questions. Uh, sometimes the questions are like, go to this motel and take a picture of all the license plates of the white cars in the parking lot. Okay? So, 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 so the thing about that, they, still have, they, still have, they have a couple hundred thousand people taking field samples for unknown strangers. Okay? Strangers could be agency. Strangers could be Al Qaeda. Strangers could be, you know, Procter & Gamble. So like, isn't that kind of unsettling in a way? Yes, okay. So like, how about this? How about if the president or the joint chief said, do we have a way to get this data right now? And you said, oh no, we have no way to do that, sir. And then his like daughters went to field agent and said, oh, why don't you use this dad? Okay, that, that's what's unsettling to me. You see what I'm saying? Like, like I know better and it's, it's, it's crazy. And I'm, not saying it's, I'm not saying this is the same as vetted information from the IC, but it's being blind to it is like not doing your job. So that, that's, that's the concern I have, okay? It's, this is just great. This, there's something horribly wrong about this, but, but it's possible. And so you should, you should like understand what that means. Okay, now, now it's gonna get more tough. So that, that's just using people. People are um, you know, elevated by technology, the phone or whatever. Now this is things that we do at Google that are gonna surprise you some. So there are a lot of people, seven billion people, but They've all taken three pictures on average. There are 20 billion photographs online shared publicly. So Google image search scours the web and we find 20 billion pictures. That's a lot of pictures. There's only so many things. So there's a lot of pictures of most things. That, that's the interesting, if you think about it that way, how many pictures of the Trevi Fountain are there in 20 billion pictures? A lot. Does that make sense? Okay, a lot of pictures of the White House, a lot of pictures of anything that you could, you could know the name of. There's a, million pictures of that thing. So we had the idea was, well, what can we do with those pictures? And so here's what we did. This is a picture that I always like. This was the first public uh, KH11 showing of a picture. It's, uh, it's okay, don't worry, it's degraded, it was shown at the Pentagon. It's, uh, it's an oblique. Um, and so, you know, obliques are kind of nice com compared to top view, so I'm kind of into obliques. We have a way to do obliques at Google too. So what we do is, this is our idea of oblique picture of uh, of, of Venice, it's done not as a single photograph. This is in Google Earth. Those are all 3D buildings. So every building there is 3D. So everywhere you go, it looks like that. You can go down all the streets, it's all 3D. All of that structure is built from aerial photographs. Okay? This is, uh, you know, there's, there's, the, um, there's the bridge everybody hikes over. Um, <clears throat> Plaza San Marco, uh, Doge's Palace. This is uh, Rome. Okay? Looks pretty convincing. It's not a photograph. I mean, this is just Google Earth flying around. You can do this on your laptop or your mobile phone, your Android phone or iPhone. So 
this imagery, um, for example, there's uh, um, the Pantheon. That, that's, that's a model contributed by a user, a 3D model made by hand. Uh, but that one isn't. And that, what that is, you can't see it probably, but what that is, is that that's a, a, a building re reconstructed by oblique aerial photography, automatically with no hu human intervention, the whole city. But we didn't have, because of urban canyon coverage masking problems, we didn't have good pictures of the first few floors of the building. That's where the street view cars come in. So we, 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 we paint the bottom floors of the buildings with street view pictures. So that building, if you look at it really closely, if you zoom in in Google Earth, there's, it looks better on the first floors than the top floors, even though it's an aerial photograph. Okay, so that's kind of cool. Um, that's the Roman uh, uh, Forum. We have historical pictures made in, in university in, uh, in Virginia of all of the Roman Forum at the time of Constantine. And in Google Earth, you can click and go back in time to see how it was, not just how it is. Okay, and which is also used by people to look at how some reactor development area, how it was and how it is, or things like that. Uh, this is a picture of St. Louis. Looks pretty much like, like St. Louis, uh, all from aerial photographs. This is a newer camera, so it looks a little bit different. Uh, and here's the newest camera we have. Uh, this is the uh, city of Tokyo. And uh, uh, I'll show you, this is, in case you've been to Tokyo, in, 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 that, that's the US Embassy in Tokyo. And if you go to this in Google Earth to look at it in 3D, and you zoom in, it's, it's exactly the building. This is extremely high resolution photography, um, much higher than, than the satellite photography is made possible, and it's completely computer generated with no intervention. So we're currently using models that are online to build a complete 3D model of the outsides of buildings for the entire planet. Okay, now, the, the question would be, you know, if you're like uh, doing a cruise missile aiming or some sort of warfighter thing, do you expect this kind of data for the entire planet? Do you wish you had it? Can you imagine saying, well, I have to leave now and go out to my car and use my, my consumer Google Earth on my phone so I can see that building before I go in there and do my mission? That, that's, that's, the, that's the dichotomy I want to talk about. Now, that, that's the current where we are. And we're also doing some work that we haven't launched. Let me show you an example of what's possible. This is one of my pictures. I'm a photographer. <clears throat> one of my pictures is St. Peter's Basilica. It's one of the most ornate and elaborate buildings in the world. Uh, you know, the Alhambra Palace and St. Peter's uh, Tie maybe. <clears throat> so imagine building a 3D model of the inside of that building. Not just the, what I showed you for Venice, but the actual going in Rome, going in the, all those mosaics and things. How would you do that? <clears throat> well, here's what you do. You go on Flickr and you get 2,000 pictures uh, taken by people tagged as my vacation in St. Peter's. And you match all the pictures up. And from those, you compute the projections of all their cameras you recompute what geometry had to be for that to work out right, and then you project all the pixels onto the geometry, and you can build that 3D model from consumer vacation pictures when they were walking through the Vatican. Okay? Now, hopefully, and even things like little cherubs. Okay? So if you imagine every soldier carrying a camera, then once they've been there, once the infantry vehicle's been there, you have a perfect 3D model even of the inside of buildings. And if you don't have that, that's a shame, because I do. So I'm not, I'm not bragging. I'm just trying to get you to think about the, 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 the gap between exotic NTM and everyday you know, McDonald's, Google kind of stuff. It's actually moving. It's shrinking. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about the ocean, because I like the ocean a lot. I like uh, ships at sea. My dad was in the Navy on a destroyer, the Hamner, and the Wiltsey in Korea. Uh, but I'm a boat guy, and so I'm going to talk about some ships. There are about 200,000 ships, vessels, 1,300 gross registered tons or larger, active on the ocean every single day. They're all moving around. Some of them are fishermen. A lot of them are fishermen. Some of them are uh, cargo carriers or oil tankers. Some of them are, uh, you know, ships from North Korea doing illicit transshipment in the middle of the ocean. There are all kinds of people that enjoy the ocean. And uh, you might wonder, from a national uh, perspective, what they're doing. And you might want to track them and say, how would you track a ship at sea? So uh, it's your question. You don't answer it out loud if you know the answer, because you aren't supposed to answer this question. But if the president or the Joint Chiefs wanted to know where all ships were all the time, every single day, could you authoritatively answer that question? It's a question. Can you answer that question? So I will tell you that the uh, admiral of the uh, uh, Coast Guard has asked me if it would be possible if someday there could ever be a question like that, answered a question like that. And I, the NRO isn't eager about questions like that. <clears throat> so I'm going to tell you how we, how we have done that. 
So I saw these maps. This is uh, just constructed from pilot, you know, logs of the tr tr uh, 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 global shipping trails just from a while back. So I thought, I want to see that as a live picture in Google Earth. Got, you know, I want to. And so <clears throat> one way to do that is to use the uh, AIS transponders that are in ships that broadcast, that ping, hey, I'm here, I'm going this speed, here's my MMSI identifier number, my, you know, IMO numbers, uh, my call sign is my, my heading, my speed, and so forth, my status, my engines are running, or whatever. <clears throat> and it's designed so that ships can help each other, or find each other, or avoid each other in, in a fog, get a closest point of approach when you're navigating, that kind of thing. So it was designed to work like at 10 mile range. Okay. It, it turns out that if, you're, if, you, if, you, if you build a really big antenna, you can put an antenna on the shore and get it at greater range. And so the University of the Aegean in Greece built tools for how to build your own AS ground station, how to, run this, how to attach it to your PC, and how to network them together online so people could build this uh, shore coastal watching ship tracking system. And so you can go to uh, uh, vesseltracker.com and you can see all the ships that are within a certain distance of shore in real time, what they're doing, what, what their heading is, click on them and get their information. It could be the fleets, it could be anybody. Now, obviously, if it's illicit bad guys, they don't have AS on, okay. But I mean, for everybody that's good, so to speak, you get them. But what about when they're out at the middle of the ocean? Well, that doesn't work because they're over the horizon, the signal's too weak. So it turns out that what you need is you need some kind of exo-atmospheric sensor platform. That is, you need a satellite in low Earth orbit with AS radios on it that has a really good ear and that listens all the time. And the one problem that these uh, happens in that, in that imagination is that the, the ships just broadcast at random. They're not synchronized. And so if I talk and you talk, we talk at the same time, nobody can tell what we said. That's called super heterodyning. And there, there are ways to deal with that. With very, like if, so if Lockheed had built the satellite, it would be a 20 gigahertz sample rate, and they would deconvolve the signals. Okay? We built the satellite, so we just built two satellites. And so uh, we had, this is, this is something done by two people. Okay, two. Uh, <clears throat> that's the, those are the, the guys there in the little suit. Those are the two satellites on the right there. Uh, they're 25 centimeter cubes. And they're being launched on a Dnieper Russian launch vehicle, multi, you know, kind of a MERV kind of thing. Uh, you pay to get a little spot and a spring, and they toss you overboard at the right time. Um, in this case, you want a little track between the two satellites because you want uh, the, the signals to have gone from one AS to the next so you can not have the same superheterodyne. But you launch, you put them there, you take them in a, in a box, you put them on the satellite, you launch them into space, okay? And let's continue with our Google Earth picture, I'll show you. This, uh, the, every dot here is the AS, complete AS packet from one of 200,000 ships. And we get that on a global basis every single day for the last year. I watch all the U.S. fleets in, in, in motion. I, I went and spoke to uh, 50 admirals from the NATO and allied uh, friendly forces in, in, in Kiel in Germany last year. I, I watch them and they can't see themselves. Okay, that just seems wrong to me. Now, I gave them a one-year warning. It's not too many days or weeks until this can be live in Google Earth for a billion people. You click on those dots, you can see the ship, what it is. This is the Carl Vinson. It's good doing this. Okay. There's, something, there's something sort of unsettling about that. Um, <clears throat> so there's some questions, like should you delay this, the report of the data? So here's the thing that I want you to think about. You could, you could easily get Google to do whatever the right thing is, but you couldn't get Al-Qaeda to do the right thing. And if these things cost $3 million for the whole program, everybody could do that. Syria could do that. North Korea could do that, right? So there's nothing, it's not about Google. It's about people who don't do it the way OMB does it or DOD does it, who can do this. And if it, if it would, if you, it, it, it angers me as a citizen that I can easily do this and the entire DOD can't do this. The NRO can't do this. It's crazy. It's just crazy. You know? Well, it's not crazy, but it's, it's uh, you know, somewhat lamentable to me. And so uh, part of my mission here is to tell you, you know, this is going to go live at some point, so if you are surprised on that day, that's your fault, because I told you. Okay? You know, think of it that way, all right? Okay, so, so, so that's why I said when consumer technology becomes NTM, 
We just wanted to see where the dots were so we could show people, hey, people use the ocean. But you can still click on it and get all the packet of data. You can click and see the picture of the boat. Okay, and there's an example. I clicked on one, and that's an oiler, and that's, that's a, a time view over the course of a month. You know, he leaves uh, uh, Gibraltar, and he, he loaded up, and he runs down along the coast. He fills up the Canary Islands with, uh, with local oil and diesel fuel, and then he makes a stop uh, on the coast of, of Africa, and he runs back up to uh, um, uh, Gibraltar. And, and that's every one of those buttons I clicked. If you click, you get his path. I'm working with presidents in uh, Indonesia and Iceland to make this kind of thing a primary weapon that they're going to use, intelligence weapon, to defend their EEZ from illicit fishing. Okay? It's, it's a service that the U.S. can't help them with, but that Google can help them with, and these two guys can help them with it. These two guys built the satellite. So, you know, I just, I, I just can't believe we have LMSC and NRO. And we, let, me, let me kind of cl close up here. People wonder, well, how do, how do, how do winners really win? And, and a lot of times, it's, it's more of your MacGyver attribute than your Einstein attribute. Right? You win because it was a serious responsibility, and you figured out how to make it work. That's how you win. And so, with that in mind, let's ask ourselves some questions. <clears throat> so if, if, if consumer technology, in some cases, is the best national technical means, then ask yourself, are you availing yourselves of that? Is the government, is the Navy, is the Army, are, are, is war fighting as an as a, uh, educated discipline, is it embracing that? I would say no, I mean, realistically. I'm here to say maybe you should embrace it more. Um, of course, General yesterday spoke about Twitter and Facebook, so you know, obviously there's, there's, there's motion. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wise motion. That is, it's, it's something to be ignored at your peril. Even if you embrace it with a lot of suspicion, you should not ignore it. That, that, that's the key. It doesn't matter how you embrace it. It matters you don't ignore it. Um, ask about some technologies. I told you I can build maps in 184 countries by local people just doing it. Does the NGA do that? Well, no. Okay. Um, I like the NGA, but I'm just, I got to compare it to somebody. Um, how about looking at, at, at 20 billion photographs and computing accurate 3D interiors and exteriors. Does NGA do that? Socket set? You know, if you, if you tried to process 20 billion pictures with a socket set, you'd be an old man. Well, have you ever done that? It's like, if you did 10 pictures, you'd be an old man. Um, global ship tracking from satellites? You know, NGA? Who could say? Global five centimeter bathymetry for the entire Earth's seafloor? Nobody. Not us either, but we're working on it. We got the machines for it. We're building them. So. There, there are technologies being built by consumer companies that, that exceed certain NTM capabilities, um, at least for our country, maybe not other countries. That's my message. Now, here's what, here's what I ask you. Is, is, is this information useful to you? And here's how I'd think about it. First of all, is the process interesting? Like a consumer company as like a hobby on the side in its spare time can build these things. So. If you can't build these things, if you don't have these things, if your associates don't have these things, you might think, maybe we're not building them on the side like Google does. Maybe we're doing them as huge 20-year national programs, and there's some, there's some relationship between what we can accomplish that way and what you can accomplish in this more casual way. Let's investigate that. You might, you might think about that for your own benefit. Second thing is the data itself. Like, do, do you have any awareness that you could know where all the ships are, and do you care as a, as a Navy man? You know, like, maybe you care. Maybe you don't care. You say, well, Probably those North Koreans, they're being nice out there. You know, I, I don't know. You know, it's, it's, but, but if you care, like, well, what are you going to do about it? You know, I, I, I met with the uh, general in charge of strategic command who, and I, this is shameful to say this, but I, I couldn't help but think this is the man who was Jack D. Ripper in, in uh, Dr. Strange Love. Uh, but I mean, it was, he wasn't, you know, but, but I, mean, I, I couldn't not think that. And uh, um, he kept talking about, I, you know, what, what does he worry about? He worries about strategic surprise, right? He doesn't care about, you know, bank robbers and all kinds of little things. He just cares about some guy with a, you know, atom gun or something from outer space, you know, something that nobody could plan for and it's uh, shocking and he can't defend us. And so let's just think of this way. Is any of this data, anything I showed you, it's all real. Is the fact that it's real in some way to you a strategic surprise? If so, you have to do something about it. You don't have to come to Google. You got to do something. Go to, go to somebody and say we should uh, pay MIT more, or we we should uh, 
trust ONR when they tell us something's important, or come to Google and we'll give you the data, or wh whatever it is, do something. Don't, don't, don't sit idly by while adversaries use new technology and you just sleep. Please don't do that. Thank you very much. Question time. Who's got a question? So it's a great honor to have a question, if it's a good question. <laughs> okay, sir. Good morning. Uh, Petty Officer Goth here, Sackier Stratcom. Uh, you guys are gathering a lot of data. Everybody's gathering a lot of data. Everybody's a node for gathering data. What reality does that create for us going forward for data? Uh, you've got groups like Anonymous, which are really pushing for information egalitarianism. WikiLeaks, other organizations like that. How do you feel and how does Google feel about the freedom of information? Should all information be free? Should somebody wearing a uniform be concerned with the amount of information that is out there for free? Or are we only free and secure if all information is free? Okay, so that's a good question. This is about uh, Google's posture and my personal posture on information and it's uh, universality of freedom or, or compartmentalization and so forth. So there, there's, um, I don't feel that all information should be accessible, no, and neither does Google. I mean, we, we say we organize the world's information, but there's an implicit perce perception there. We organize the world's voluntarily provided information. You know, you make a website, we'll index it. We're not going to break into your house and look for your website. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not that. It's that if you make it public and you want the world to find it, we'll help the pu public find it. So the uh, sort of WikiLeaks kind of scenario involves information that the agency involved didn't try to make public, right? So that would never happen with Google or any kind of company. That was an illicit, crazy thing. Um, but, but what is important to know about WikiLeaks is that apparently uh, one bad actor who signed the same, you know, FS86 form that I signed or whatever, and who swore an oath to his country was all it took to touch everybody in the world with, with information that shouldn't be shared. So that, that fact is the fact. So to fail to recognize that is, is, is a very important oversight. It doesn't mean that somehow it's okay to do it because you can get away with it, you know? Like might doesn't make right, but there's a technical might now that every one of you could broadcast the most sensitive thing, even if you went to Leavenworth later, you'd already have done it. Whereas in World War II, you'd only get down to the end of the street before you got shot or, you know I mean? You, there's a, a tremendous spread of information is possible now. And I mentioned in the beginning that my friends and I had built Google Earth. Well, you know, it went from, you know, my house to your house to the whole world, to the Carl Vincent, to everywhere. Well, that same magic that makes that possible makes WikiLeaks possible. You know, it's, it's like a gun. You can aim it wisely or poorly. So, so that's the world we live in. So, so our position is that, you know, you should be a grown up and realize it's a dangerous world of information, but that doesn't excuse rogue behavior. And so that's, a, that's like police, you know. People can always rob you, and the police should always arrest them, you know. But there's no real prior restraint. You don't know when they're going to do it. Is that a good, does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. On this side? Yeah. Uh, Scott Kinner with the Marine Corps uh, Tactics and Operations Group. Um, I'll try to turn this into a question. Um, I have a question. I just want to try to narrow it down to something you can answer. A couple things jumped out at me. Um, the first one you mentioned, um, it's not a matter of is the data there. It's can you extract the data? That's the first part of my multi-part question. The second thing you said that I thought was interesting was uh, data versus information and then information versus understanding and knowledge, two different things. So as you present all these things to us that can be done, it strikes me they're a bit reactive. You know, we're looking at, oh, hey, there happened to be this one guy who saw the raid, and of course we saw that later, and isn't that interesting? And it is. My question to you is, from the consumer standpoint, from people who are sitting here saying, yeah, we need to know some of this, how, uh, what are your recommendations, what are your thoughts in the cyber domain of how we're going to actually be able to data, data mine? How are we going to get access to what we need to know when we need to know it? When we are literally overcome by data. Okay, that, that's, that's a good question. That, so that's the, that's the, like the, uh, you know, uh, I'm so hungry, I can't eat anymore, but it all looks good, I still want some dessert problem, you know. So, so, you, you, you uh, so full. So, so it's, uh, there, 
there's a there's a paucity of data problem, and there's a uh, embarrassment of riches of data problem. And they're both a problem. You know, that is there. There's not enough to form a good opinion. There's too much to find the data out of that to form a good opinion. And, and for example, in, 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 in real NTM, which I didn't really talk about, but we can get a lot of data now. We have some really good sensors, right? So just putting it somewhere is a problem. You know? So, so uh, it's uh, what, what, I would, what I would argue, and this is uh, an optimism of mine, technical optimism. It's not like some answer, but you, you don't solve problems in advance. It's just not the human nature. You don't solve problems in advance. You don't train for wars in advance. I mean, not, you train, but it's the wrong training. You, know, you, you just, if something happens, you react to it. That's how people are. And so, and so what, uh, what, what, what you'll find, and I know there's a lot of efforts to do better than that, but that's still the basic nature of human, humanity. So basically, we didn't have enough information, so we wanted cell phones that we could email while we're walking around. So everybody loved their Blackberry. And that wasn't enough. Now you want to do web browsing, so you had to get an iPhone, right? Okay, so you know, it's this constant thing. Sooner you're going to wear glasses, right? And eventually you'll say, this is absurd. I, I never like have any peace in my life, right? So that's kind of your question. What do you do next? Well, one is you need tools. The computer becomes a tool in winnowing down the abundance of information to the fine information. And, and what's surprising, and it's important to think about, is that it's easier to write that tool the more data there is. Now, as, as, as a person, too much data is always worse, but as a computer, too much data, it's better and better and better from a signal to noise ratio standpoint. Because the computer doesn't get tired. You can have a thousand computers or a million computers or what, you know, whatever you want. Um, so, so actually more data is better, it's never worse. Like in crypto, more signal is better, it's never worse. Because you can always like build more basements at the NSA. But, but, you, but you, know, you have more, more chances to figure out what's going on, right? So, so you want more data. So what we need and we don't have in the consumer space or in our personal lives and, is, is intelligent agents helping us analyze data. We don't have enough of that. Okay, so, um, and, and that's, that, 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 that's coming, it's coming. And, and it, it actually gets easier the higher the resolution of the data is. It's easier the more frequent the picture is. You know, so the, the, if you had continuous super res, res coverage of imagery, you could, have, you could, you could easily spot um, precursor patterns of SAM sites and all kinds of things, right? It's very easy. If you have a once a decade picture obliquely when the leaves are on, you have no chance of that. Or maybe the analysts can look at it for a long time, but it's, 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 the more data you have, the easier it gets. That, that, that's my answer, such as it is. Hey, good morning. Thank you for your interesting presentation. I'm Kurt Hamill. I work at Esri. I'm also a retired Navy captain. And uh, in our discussions with uh, OpNav Intu and six staff, uh, Admiral Jan Tai is, um, is she's the head of decision superiority director, director of decision superiority in 2 and 6 and uh, 4 F. Uh, she describes decision superiority as being able to take uh, Navy sensor data together with national sensor data, apply advanced analytics to answer operational questions in all mission areas. And that's really the focus of decision superiority. So my, I guess my, my question to you is, um, you know, you clearly have a, have a, a wonderful program to develop data and information, but how are you answering those operational questions in those mission areas? Okay, well, this is my chance to celebrate Esri and Jack and Laura and all things like that, that if I wanted to do that, I would go to Esri and buy ArcGIS, you know? Um, or I would go to Envy and buy, you know, Envy software and do hyper, you know, hypersexual map production. I mean, that's, there are tools that are great for that. Google Earth, for example, is a data visualization tool. You know, once you've done the Esri part, We'll let all the people figure out what it means and live it perfectly. But there's a thinking part and a showing part, and so we're happy to be that. And Google doesn't really work too hard to move beyond that. I mean, we do some things we're proud of, but you know, it's totally fine that we build the visualization tool. It's not no problem for us. Um, on a larger, more national scale, uh, the intelligence community is starting to use some Google products in ways that are really, really helpful. Um, and, and the one I'll just mention because it's it's something you don't know about maybe. There's something we have called the Google Search Appliance, which is uh, it's great, and it's, it's the best thing we have that nobody knows about. You know, so it's uh, and I'm not in sales mode. I just want you to know with this technology, it's a it's a it's a little box or a big box, whatever. That is what Google Search is in a box, but it doesn't have any data on it. But it, it, you bring it into your data center and plug it in on your network, and you tell it index this database, that database, this Oracle server, that whatever. And, and basically, it becomes Google Search, but for your enterprise. So let's say you had a lot of imagery analysts. You can analyze all of their write-ups over the years, 
and then somebody can just type in a little web search window inside on a classified network, does anybody ever look at that house? It'll say, yes, seven years ago, this guy looked at that house and the one next to it. And they were thinking they were doing so-and-so from some little note from some guy that's long forgotten. So it's, it's fantastic. It's weaving an enterprise network of data together in an unstructured way. That's a popular thing. So that's an example of a way that Google can help. Obviously, you can't put your data on the web for Google to index it in the public way, but we can give you a little unit of Googleness to stick into your classified network to do it you know, on your ship or wherever you want. And that's really helpful for people. So there's some ways we can help, but in general, you know, deep analytics, I think that's something you should do. So, for example, I go to Spa War, they use their fancy stuff to analyze certain things. I won't go into that. But then the end result is they look at it on Google Earth and so do people on ships. Well, you know, that's a good relationship. The, the, the viewing part, we provide the tool for that, and the thinking part, they do is their research. And it, it could be, as we, in this case, it's custom code, but, but that, kind of, that kind of process. Same with the national labs. You know, you might have uh, muon imaging looking at uh, special, looking for special nuclear materials, moving around the country and just in case. But that, that's fantastic. But the result needs to be like a big map with a dot that says, go there and shoot that guy. You know, like, you know, so, so the, that map is Google Earth and the other stuff is whatever Lockheed built for you or whatever. You know, so, so there's a good part, oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. There's a good partitioning between the, the kind of the consumer part and the specialist part. Yes, ma'am. Good morning, Commander Sue Dalton from Nav Common Nav Air Land. Um, last couple of days, we've heard a lot of different people talking about uh, the cyber world and um, the <coughs> world in the, which we live in, in the military, and it's a lot of the message that we received was where there's a lot of information and we don't know how to colluge all that information together to make a better warfighter or to make a better solution, and you've obviously done that. Um, and it's awesome. I mean, personally, I'm a computer science major, so I'm, this is awesome. Um, two questions. One We're always is, hiring, by the way. <laughs> that's part of my question, actually. <laughs> I think about myself. But one part is an ethics question. Uh -huh. um, when you have those conversations back in your office about releasing a new technology that could potentially, and I'm not even, not even specifically hurt the military, but hurt the United States, the security of the United States as we know it, um, do you have a, you know, kind of a, an ethics checklist that you go through and, and how does that kind of play out? And um, my second question is, when you do talk to our leadership, um, you know, it's, it's all about budgets and all, all about money and um, are they able to be responsive right now to take advantage of these technologies right now or are we just sitting back? Um, saying that's really cool. We still don't, we still don't know how to collude it together with how we're doing business because we obviously are working at the speed of sound and you're look, working at the speed of light. Okay, thank you. Th those are those are two of the best questions I've ever been asked. So th thank you, seriously, ever. That's just great. So uh, the they're, they're they're so different. I, I'll answer both of them, and, and probably that's the last question. So that's that's. They're, they're really great, um, better than my, I should have just talked about your questions, actually. Um, the first one is, is, is the inventor's responsibility to future society. So, you know, so like, uh, should Thomas Edison have pondered the moral damage inventing the movie uh, camera that porn would cause, you know, for example? Well, he couldn't possibly have imagined that, right? Just as, as, as an observation, right? So he, he thought, well, I can take a, a kinescope. I can make a moving picture. That'll be moving like a horse. He didn't think about Steven Spielberg. He didn't think about Walter, you know, about, he didn't think about anything. He just said, it's a moving horse. Look at that. You can see its gait, you know? So, so the inventor tends to be sort of smart but dumb like that, you know? Like, uh, you know, we thought of people looking at, kids looking at the earth and, knowing where the Pacific Ocean was when we built Google Keyhole. We didn't imagine, you know, Al-Qaeda terrorists planning some plot in some, you know, we, it, it, just, it was like we were not equipped to comprehend even that kind of use. So typically inventors have no clue what possible harm can come from their invention. So that's, that's number one. And so, and, and so that's, you know, for example, just to give me an example, it's Facebook, it's going public today, right, or whatever. Uh, one in five divorces in England, in the United Kingdom, use Facebook evidence in the divorce case. Okay. 
Mark Zuckerberg did not plan that when he was in college, right? You know what I'm saying? There's no way you could say, should I do this because, you know, sleazy people in England are going to get in trouble? You know what I mean? It, you just can't, you just can't imagine that, seriously, you know? So, so uh, you know, Vince Cerf, my colleague, his buddies building the internet, couldn't imagine Julian Assange using that as a weapon against all the good people of the world, right? It just, you can't imagine those things, for good or bad, whatever they are. So, in general, that means that the inventors don't think about those issues because they just can't. They're not visible that far in advance. You, you just can't perceive it. And you see warfighters who, uh, like, you know, U.S., fantastic in every war, and then at the end of the war, we've got to somehow keep the peace, and we're like, maybe not so good at that as we are as, as, as precision bombing. And so we don't even think about that part at the start. You know, it's only hopefully a short period later. So, so I, I think that, um, no, we don't think about it as well as you might wish. That, that's part one. And then part two is despite our inadequacy, we try really hard to think about it in a very deep and good way. So in our you know, in, in, innocent engineering way, we try really hard. We, we think about it personally, like as a person building a product. Does it have security implications? Does it change like some kind of balance of power that messes up industries? Who should we tell first? We did Street View. We spent almost a year talking to um, women's shelters, uh, privacy groups, all kinds of groups, uh, police. Is it going to be a mistake? You know, we spent like a huge amount of effort on that. We didn't think of everything, but we, we, everything that could be thought of, we thought of. And for things that are really big, like if we get pictures from Digital Globe or GOI that show uh, rockets in the air between Israel and Palestine or somewhere uh, in Iraq or Iran, should we publish it that day or should we hold off? Well, you know, there's no legal guidance on that. I mean, you guys have shutter control, so if you didn't want the picture taken, you could have stopped them. But if, if they give it to us, we, we could show it. There's no legal against that. But it doesn't seem like a sporting thing to do. So we ended up asking advisors like uh, Colin Powell and uh, uh, Brent Scrocroft, and we have about 30 people that we kind of hang out with who we just ask them questions and say, what would you do in this case? And they, they give us their opinion, and we say, you know, it looks like these guys don't like it if you use it in less than 60 days, but somewhere 60 to 90 days seems like that's fair. And so we form our policies with that as a, as a guidance council, but it's not, it, 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 you know, it, we do, we do, so we, do, we try hard, but I don't think we're perfect. So that, that, that's the answer to that, and my time is up. I'll give you the second answer when I come back and see you, okay? I'm sorry. Thank you. Now, Mr. Jones, I really want to take the opportunity to say thank you so very, very much for your innovative insights into global information. You've opened our aperture. You've opened the aperture of the world. When you take a look at what you have said, much of what you've said becomes tools in the kit bag, as I will say, of the commander, and that means commander of any one of our five armed forces, uh, branches of the United States Armed Forces, our coalition. And let's not forget our first responders. Much of what you said here applies globally, yes, within the United States for humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, firefighters, EMTs, uh, law enforcement. You have opened the aperture here just as you have addressed global information. So I, you take a look at this and the businessmen and women in this, uh, in this audience, again, what great takeaways. We know that you believe in the human dimension. You talked about that, that throughout all this technology it's the human dimension. So with that, we would like to make a presentation to you of a small token here of a book that is uh, entitled Joe Roach for His War. And what we're talking about here is the odyssey of the, uh, <clears throat> the code talker who broke and outwitted Yamamoto at the Battle of Midway. Again, thinking forward, whether you're talking about Thomas Edison, Charles Darwin, moving forward and change, what was in the head of those who did this? With that, we say thank you very much, Mr. Thank John. you, sir. Thank you Great. so much. Thank you. <clears throat>